Welcome to the eighth episode of MD's Lever Owner Report with my host, Ron Harris in the house. Ron, yeah. topping it off, brother, we have a special guest, an yeah. icon, one of my very good friends, a legend himself. I believe he probably competed a lot longer than I did, certainly in a lot more shows than I did, I believe. Milo Sarchev, welcome to the MD Lever Owner Report. Milos. Hey, Kevin, it's it's honor to be here. But I, I'm going to correct you. I think you competed longer than me, but I did probably a little bit, uh, you know, a few extra shows, you know, because, uh, you know, I did initially, like, every single show that was organized. You catch up later on. You did, like, uh, 92, 93, 94, 97 European Tour with me, but then you also went 95 and 96, which I haven't been there. Yeah. But listen, I mean, I, I'm going to tell you, I turned pro before you, but uh, I remember following you, you, you placed second in Junior Nationals 91 to Paul De Mayo. But then same year, you came back to the Nationals 91 and it beat everybody, you know, Flex and Paul and Ronnie and I mean, everybody. So you were that wonder that is coming in the 92, uh, you know, pro season, pro, pro league. And uh, I was with you at the pro debut that you did in Chicago. You know, you placed third, you know, you were yes. slightly off there. So uh, Porter and uh, Terry Postel edged you. But I don't know if you remember this. Okay, first time really that I seen you up close is a couple of weeks later at uh, uh, the Night of the Champions. You called me and said, like, can you check on me uh, in my condition? And I said, okay. And I'm competing with you. I said, okay, come you, to my room. Yeah, you came to my room, I remember. Uh, or, or vice versa, yeah. No, I thought that you came to my room. But either way, uh, you were so goddamn ripped, so goddamn dry. <laughs> I mean, this, this was like freaky, freaky, really. And uh, and and you established yourself as a front runner. But uh, uh, I do know that. Uh, uh, okay, a lot of people are gonna maybe disagree or something. For me, you won '92 Olympia as well. Uh, I was in Helsinki. I don't know how you feel about it. Dorian was still not so freaky. And uh, for me, you just had a better combination of everything, you know? Mm -hmm. So then we went to a uh, European tour and uh, um, I, I think you you won one show in, in uh, 90, 92 tour, but then uh, uh, you and I went to a seminar in Bern Beiderbecke's gym. And I don't know if you remember that one. I, and Bielefeld, I, Bielefeld, Bielefeld, Bielefeld yes. But uh, I don't know if you remember this moment. Uh, I said it before because I was shocked. Somebody at the seminar that was inside the gym, you know, asked you like, oh, Kevin, we heard you can do 10 reps with the 200 kilo bench. And I said, yep. So what do you do? You got up, you walked to the bench. <laughs> I think I remember that. I crawled underneath the weight, right? <laughs> yeah, you did a little warm up with the, with the 225 and then you put the, you know, uh, 200 kilos, which is like uh, four and a half plates, and you're doing like 13 reps. I was like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, this is pretty much cold. But then, you yeah. see, I never talked to you about this one, because uh, as you know, my my good friend and athlete, Ryan Crowley, got the, you know, uh, pack tear, and I appreciate you you called him. Yeah. Uh, shortly after this, you tore the pack. How did you yes, tear uh, bench pressing 600. Actually, I was going down for a double. I was too lean and I came home off the show and it was in February yeah. and I was bench pressing 600. And then, yeah, that's what happened. Wow. I tore, I tore my chest the same way he tore his. Matter of fact, I think I tore it worse. Mm -hmm. I tore my pectoralis major and minor and snapped my tendon off the bone. Mm -hmm. Everything. See, like people don't understand. They just see, wow, well, oh, that's a torn chest. No, but when you have that amount of weight, it blows everything out. I was in a uh, 12 hour surgery um, and then it got infected. So two weeks later I had to go back in for, because I got an infection. They put screws yeah. down through the tendon. It was enough of the tendon hanging out to where they could screw it back down into the bone and connect it. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was excruciating, man. I was out for uh, from February, March, April, May, June, July. And then we had to be on stage to compete, Milos, you know that, by yeah, September. Yeah. So it was July, it was August and September. So I only had like a little time to get ready for that show. But I lost, uh, I was 240 some pounds when I came home that year. And I, I, I lost like 20 pounds, 20, 23 pounds 
Um, and I had to somewhat get ready to be back on stage to compete. You know, it was a miracle so, that I did it. This was uh, end of 92, before 93 season, or there was 92? Yeah. yeah, it was 1992. I just got second in Olympia. Yeah, because let me tell you. No, when wait, you, this... you toured in 93, early 93, right? No, no, but yeah, but I, I came home in February of 1993, I yeah. toured. Okay. Yeah. You know, because we were on the tours and everything, like Milo said. But when I got home, yeah, I, I toured in uh in February. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so 93 Olympia, yeah. You you placed like fifth, right? And yeah. uh, and then we still went to European Grand Prix Tour. And <laughs> I have to say this publicly. One time I did beat you was 93 in, in France. And uh -huh. uh, you know, of course, that was like a major thing for me, like, oh, because you know, I, I never thought I could ever beat you. Of course, you had a, such a better physique than me. Uh But then when I look at the videos later, I say, how the hell did I beat you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, I, know Milos, I know how. See, There's the Serbian the, judges. Yeah. You know, the, thing, the thing with Milos is Milos was always in shape. He was carrying a tad bit. Work. But Milos, you're very known for your abs, his midsection. If you look at the pictures, Milos kind of remind me of Lee Labrada because he had that shape like a Lee Labrada, but bigger. But his abs, his midsection, what really made him stand out. And then another thing that Milos, another thing you had was uh, you were a fantastic poser. You know, your posing was on point. I know people talk about my posing and everything, but some of those routines you put together Thank was you. just phenomenal. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you pose off Phantom of the Opera? I, I did in uh, my guest posing, not really at the, at the shows. No, no, but uh, Phantom of the Opera is yeah, one of the... Uh, My favorite, I did back in like 92, 93. Yeah. But I, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, we were guest posing in that, uh, in Germany, I did it uh, that time. You were there too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's maybe why. Yeah, I remember. A lot of history. Ron, like, uh, I mean, Milos, you know, Milos, we would be on tour. I mean, Milos, tell him, we would do, after the Olympia, we go on tour. And that was like the time where, You know, you, you had you could experiment with the carbs. I remember you you and Sonny always uh, experimenting with the carbs and you were like coaching Sonny d back then and you were coming in just learning everything. I mean, yeah. it's amazing, Milos, how how you still remember every single thing and you revolved so much. But back then, remember you guys used to carve up on a lot of rice. I remember you used to eat a lot of rice and you guys eat a lot of rice. And I remember asking you, You and Sonny would always be over in, in, in your rooms and traveling together, and you would always be doing your research on what worked, what not worked. So I know you did a lot of experimenting. How did that experimenting and things that you've learned then, back in 1990s, apply to what you're going today? You know, you're working with a lot of people, you're coaching a lot of people. And of course, uh, what is the difference in these athletes now? than when we were uh, back there doing our diets and, and everything that we were going through. Uh, yeah, tell us that experience, the, the difference that you see. You see, the, the thing is what the people say, uh, a gram of practice can be heavier than ton of theory, right? There's a lot of those uh, scientists and gurus uh, nowadays that uh, you know, want to talk to talk because they see some Google research and they, they haven't tried it. You and I and Sonny and everybody else back in the day, we traveled six weekends to six different countries, compete on the road, right? So this is a hands-on experience. Like you said, we were experimenting. You have uh, some uh, basic, basic knowledge and approach. And I know that you were always on the lower carbs. You were fish and green bean and, and martini kind of that, uh, yeah. diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I, I was I was experimenting with because because you know we are always afraid of applying it. Oh, maybe it's too much. Maybe I spill over. You know. So when you're on a tour like this, I say, okay. You know, what do I have to lose? And like I said, I was a fan of the sport. I mean, listen, for me, just being next to you and Ronnie and and uh, Flex and uh, everybody else, this was like uh, Disneyland for me. Okay, to compete, I knew I, I wasn't at your guys' level. You know, so I could, you know, just maybe squeak in with the with the great presentation and great conditioning. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, as you know, uh, I brought this high carbohydrate and then insulin into the sport. And uh, many people were like judging me for it. 
But listen, uh, as you know, in the 90s, uh, you know, insulin made a difference. I mean, uh, there was uh, there was a uh, top pros. I, I don't know about you because you you and I never talked about insulin. I just heard that in one of the shows, um, Dave Palumbo uh, helped you and you did touch the insulin. Yeah, that was uh, 1996. But uh, yeah, but I think it was not, what year did I win that Arnold Classic? Was it 96 or 97, right? 96, 96. Yeah, 96. It was 1996. But Milos, mm-hmm. were you? That was the first time I ever did it and the only time that I ever did it. I, I didn't yeah. like, it made me big, it made me thick, and it made me full, and I lost some conditioning. Conditional. When did you when did you start with the whole insulin thing, and how did you get that idea to come up with the insulin? Where did you yeah, learn that? Night- 93, uh, you know, the, the thing that I, I've seen some from uh, uh, East German and Russian reports, you know, the, what they're using. So they were using uh, all kinds of stuff and they were using insulin back in the day, like in the 80s, like, oh, shit. So I said, like, why insulin? And then when I researched a little bit, it's a strong anabolic hormone, it's a storage hormone. So how do you use it? How do you manipulate it? And I was thinking, like, hold on a second. If I use it to my advantage, which means around the training, so I can push everything into the muscle, that could mm. be something. But at the time, there was no protocols that you can you can actually uh, find out and learn. So uh, I was a guinea pig myself. I would you know do a certain amount of uh, units. And uh, back in the day, there was not that fast acting. There was humulin R and U. You know, the, the different uh, uh, onset and peak and duration. So. Uh, you know, I realized one pharmacologist told me you have to create environment that your body is accustomed to, which means normally you eat, your blood sugar level increases, your pancreas releases insulin. So insulin mm-hmm. is in the body just when there is a high blood sugar. Okay, so mm-hmm. if I inject it and I don't take it, enough carbs on, uh, on time, it's not available, you know, my sugar is going to crash. I'm going to go hypo and it can be very dangerous. So of course, when you have no idea, you start with the, you know, let's say 10 units of uh, insulin and then 30, 40 grams of carbs, which was obviously not enough. And then hypoglycemia hit me and then, oh shit, I had to take more. So as uh, I experimented, I found the, the right ratio. And uh, I actually published this uh, article in Muscle Media 2000 back in the day. Uh, hmm. I was professional ex and uh, I, I described all this. Uh, that was you? Vibe. I knew it. That was that me. I knew it. <laughs> that was me, yeah. You know, I was, of course, under weather contract, so I wasn't allowed to do that. So they just used, uh, uh, you know, professional ex. But listen, I mean, uh, you know that Ronnie and Flex, and you competed with them back in the 90s, and mm-hmm. you guys were so competitive. I mean, you, you guys went back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it's an interesting thing, and uh, I want to ask you, because uh, uh, I asked Ronnie what is his best version, and he says 98 uh, Olympia. Uh, two days ago, I've seen Flex Wheeler at uh, Jake Cutler Classic, and I asked him, okay, uh, Flex, when do you think is your absolute best? And he says right away, uh, 99 British Grand Prix, mm-hmm. okay? So I want to know, Kevin, what do you think is your best ever? I have two two moments where I think uh, phenomenal condition and best rip shred I've ever been in my life was at the Night of Champions in 1992. Yeah, that was when yeah. I was shredded to the bone. Like I couldn't get any more leaner. Um, far yeah. as me having thickness, fullness, and uh, conditioning, I and feeling great, I would have to say 2000, Mr. Olympia, for me. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I was about 248 pounds on that stage and I just felt good. I wasn't, you know, you know, you know that feeling, Milos, when you get it, you over, you overdo it sometimes. And you, those lights hit you and you starting to flatten out. 2000, Mr. Olympia, I, I just, I, I held my conditioning all the way through. I felt great. My energy was up. You know, everything was popping at, at that show. So those are, those yeah. are the two for me, for me, you know. Yeah. But how, see, about, okay. how about for you, Milos? How about for you? Yeah. For me, uh, you know, 99, I was the biggest ever. And uh, at that British Grand Prix, I mean, I was 255. Uh, Flex told me he was 256 in the uh, in, uh, uh, 99 British Grand Prix. Like, whoa. Mm. I was 255, exploding full and all that stuff, you know. So from an aspect of a size, maybe I was way more competitive. And I beat Nasser and Marcus Rule, you know, and that's 99. 
Wow, and I, I called you know pretty well on, on the size department, but it was not me. I like my physique 97, you know, uh, you know, slim down. And it's very interesting because now you confirm 92. So that's the beginning of your pro career. It's basically yeah. your second pro show. And I agree with you. I've seen you with people didn't see it the day before <laughs> in the room. And it was like fucking unbelievable. I remember shreds upon. You could not be, like you said, leaner than that. No. Uh, that's uh, Andreas Munzer kind of uh, uh, conditioning with a thin skin, dryness, uh, you know, and enough size. Hmm. Now, fast forward to uh, later that year, Olympia. Do you think you could have taken Dorian that, that year? Um, you're, you're saying, yeah. Uh, the only thing, the only thing, Milos, I had that conditioning, conditioning towards the front. But I lost it. I lost it when I turned around from the back because my back had flattened out a little bit. And, and I'm going to tell you why. It was because of the plane flight. Yeah, you know, it was because of the plane flight. And I was very low on my carbs when I left the United States. And when I flew all the way to Helsinki, Finland, I didn't really carb up that much. Like if I had I had someone like you next to me saying, hey, you know, looking at me. But I flew by myself and I didn't have a coach, you know, so. Yeah. I didn't have anybody to watch my back to say, hey, look, and you got to also think I, I, I hadn't had that much experience in, in really competing. So I had just turned pro, went to, went mm -hmm. to uh, you know, uh, won a night, of, no, went to Chicago with you guys, went to the night of champions. Then I went to the Olympia. So I didn't really know what carving up was or anything. You know, if I had a, if I had a new, had a little more insight or education on, hey, you know, land, carb up, throw these carbs in you for two days, I probably would have looked up completely, you know, even more incredible. But I thought my back was just a little, little yeah. flattened out for me, for me personally, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I know that you, you guys all give great respect to Dorian. By all means, uh, you know, there's nothing but the respect for Dorian, right? But uh, you hear many times uncrowned Mr. Olympia, Flex, yeah. Kevin Sean, because you guys were at the time being beaten by... Uh, um, Dorian, and it was close. I mean, you were second four times, right? And I can only yeah, imagine yeah. how close you got so many times and, and then, then it was taken away from you. But I would tell you, uh, 94 at Olympia, I was there, of course. It's different when you're on the stage looking at the guys. 95, right. I wasn't competing. I went you know, to the audience. And in 95, I think that was Dorian's craziest condition. You, yeah. you did, yeah, you play second. And, uh, you know, of course, I love your physique 100 times more. But then, I, you know, when I've seen Dorian, like you said, when he turns around and does his uh, lat pose and striations go all over the place and then yeah. opens up. Yeah, so I, I could see the judges would give him on the conditioning and just crazy back. But mm -hmm. for me, this is still not bodybuilding. If bodybuilding is shape, aesthetics, balance, everything else, not freakiness. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you said at 92, NOC is your favorite look, you know, but you had that crazy chest, crazy shoulders, crazy uh, arms. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine if uh, somebody filled you up with the insulin. <laughs> 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 no, seriously. Oh, but uh, I yeah. am that serious. We talked in your last show in Australia, you know, your, your mm -hmm. last, last, last show that you did. And yeah. uh, um, I remember talking to you and you told me you never really did it. Uh, put it this way. Uh, Any times when people would see me backstage or in a, in a, a contest, I walk in and say, you you don't look so big. You look bigger on the stage. I always created the illusion of being bigger on the stage mm -hmm. because of that, you know, carb loading and everything else. Yeah. And then, you know, now that you're telling me, so 99, you were on the stage at the British Grand Prix with fully loaded Flex and uh, Ronnie. Mm -hmm. You know, they were using insulin, obviously. And you were not. You were super no. competitive. Yeah. Yeah. You I were wasn't. super competitive. I mean, yeah. uh, didn't you get the, I mean, you heard <laughs> early 90s about insulin. You didn't get the urge to, to try it. You just said, like, you don't need it. No, no, because I tried it that one time when Dave Palumbo had come down and introduced me to it. Yeah. It made me, it made me full, but I was very uneducated. You know, I, I relied yeah. a lot on 
just training hard in the gym and stuff like that. I really didn't have, you guys are a lot more advanced, you know? I mean, I, I'm over in Maryland by myself and you guys are, <laughs> you guys are in the middle of everything. Like I wasn't, I didn't have anybody on my team that even, that was even at that level, you know? So uh, I just ate, you know, trained hard and, yeah. and did my work in the gym. But outside of that, I just relied on going to the shows and, uh, what was that? But I didn't know much about carb loading or 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 any of that stuff. You yeah, know, no. that, uh, normally you were in the very low carbs. Even when we traveled, yeah. you know, <laughs> in Europe, you were very low carbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's interesting. But uh, let Miles. me ask you this. Yeah, okay, go ahead. This, everybody uh, is asking me this. What do you think that Kevin would uh, look like if he didn't take so much time off and then he just uh, kept training, you know, like uh, year around? Because I, I did a uh, uh, 550 workouts per year for 15 years straight. I never took wow. uh, time off. You would do the yeah. Olympia and then you would disappear and uh, you would look like a, a swimmer at the best. <laughs> and then, yeah, I would. Yeah, in a matter of like, uh, what, six, eight weeks, you would come back like crazy. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I noticed, Milos, that I had a quick response. When I tore my chest, remember mm -hmm. I told you I tore my chest. I didn't work out for seven months. And then I got ready for the Olympia in a matter of like uh, less than 12 weeks, you know, after that serious pec tear injury. Then I realized that, you know, I really didn't need all year uh, to prepare for a contest. I could do it in, in three months or four months. So that's kind of like where I started, how I was introduced to that, you know. And I was afraid that if I trained all year round, I would get so big and so strong that I didn't want to end up hurting myself again. So I kind of like, kind of, you know, gauged it and pulled back a little bit, you know? Yeah, but listen, listen to this. I was afraid to get too big. <laughs> <laughs> who, who says that? You know, nobody. Yes. But, uh, okay, another thing that was very characteristic for you, I mean, your uh, strength. You could push anything. Chest, shoulders, you know. I mean, uh, even now, after age of 50, I saw you coming back. And by the way, you were going to do the bench press contest. I don't know if you ever did it. Or the break no, the no, I, I decided didn't. not to do it. Yeah, I yeah, decided not to do it. I didn't want to hurt myself, you know. So Good. I just said, you know, not to do it, you know. I didn't have anything else to prove. But um, talking about the strength, I mean, when I was, uh, you know, before I even turned pro, before I even competed in bodybuilding, um. I was 185, 189 pounds, and I bench press uh, four, 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 four forty five, I think four forty five in a bench press competition. I had a shirt on, so I was natural when I did that. Wow. I was always naturally strong, you know. Hmm. I was yeah. naturally strong. Yeah. But over age of fifty, you were still. You know, when I see the videos, you were doing behind and neck shoulder presses with the yeah, four plates. Yeah the, the, yeah, the crazy thing. I mean, this yeah. is... He was doing that like a month, like a month ago. Bro. He just did that like a month ago, didn't he? Didn't you do that, uh, It Kevin? wasn't a month ago. No, it wasn't a month ago. But Milos, I wish I had a known. You were keeping all this stuff a secret. Your little insulin. You were keeping that a secret. No. You were hiding it. You weren't... I didn't know you were doing insulin in 1993 and 1994 and stuff. Nobody <laughs> shared that information Listen, with me. I, I promise you... Uh, Everybody uh, that asked me, I would tell them. I mean, I, I told uh, uh, Nasser 95. Then, uh, of course, uh, Chad Nichols find out mm. from him. And then he asked me, can you explain it? So I did. You know, uh, Chuck Sano that was uh, in Chicago. I was guest positive with Kim Krzyzewski. And he says, like, okay, uh, would you tell Chad? <laughs> and I sit down and explain everything that I... I never had a secret, I promise. I mean, of course, I would love to talk to you. I had all the respect and... You, you, you and Flex, uh, you know, and Charles Claremont, uh, my favorite physiques of all time, right? So I would have told you there's really no secret. It's just yeah. we never came so, to that point to, to so, talk. So I'm going to come clean with you. You know what my cycle was? My cycle, getting ready for the Mr. Olympia and the shows. Um, I would do uh, 400 milligrams of uh, test a week yes. yeah. for six weeks. I would do... Uh, no, no, no. 600 milligrams of test, 400 milligrams of DECA. I would run that for uh, six weeks. And then I would do uh, Anadrol 
100 milligrams of uh, Anadrol, 2902 <laughs> Syntex Anadrol. Yeah. Um, and Winstrel V. Uh, and uh, I would do 20 milligrams of Novadex. And I would <laughs> cut all my orals out a month before the show. So the only, the last six weeks for the show, I would run Anadrol for one month, stop that. The last two weeks, I would go to hollow testing and that would be it to the day of the yeah, show, did, Mr. Olympia, you know? You did the injectables with it, didn't you? Injectable you know? what? Yeah, like test propionate or Vinstrol. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was injectables, yeah. yeah. You just uh, add that one. Yeah. You know, listen, I, I absolutely believe you. And uh, Oh, yeah. If I had yeah. known you were the were the chemist, the mastermind. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I, 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 I never been twice as twice as big as I was. Well, I'm Milo, serious. I, I got, never put my services but if anybody would ask me i would tell them uh, it was never secret i mean there is so many i tell you gustavo badel back in uh, 98 i saw him as like man you know uh, you have a great physique let me help no 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 mm -hmm. he waited until i retired 2003 <laughs> and then mm -hmm. uh, he hires me so like, mm -hmm. what you know and you see what happened i mean he yeah. third to place in the olympia, olympia. Yeah, yeah, right after for milos milos let's switch gears a little bit let's talk yeah. about your market and let's talk about how how marketable you was, you know, for, for Joe Weider in, in the Federation. And you were always in shape and everything. I mean, tell us about your relationship with, uh, with uh, Joe Weider and, Joe and, and, okay. and everything. You know, one of the first things uh, that happened was uh, I ran into the Sean Ray back in 91. And he told me right away, hey, kid, <laughs> even though I was older than him, uh, yeah don't ever refuse the photo shoot, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, and uh, initially I wasn't with Weider. Uh, I had like, probably like about 10 covers of a Muscle Mag International. I had mm -hmm. a few from uh, Muscle Development, right? But then I signed for, for Joe. And uh, I mean, I don't know, you see, uh, in Muscle Fitness, they didn't want a freaky bodybuilders like yourself. Mm -hmm. they, they looked like more as a man's physique, <laughs> classic physique. Uh, you know, uh, guy. So I was in the covers, but I only made a couple of covers of a Flex magazine because uh, mm -hmm. I guess I didn't have enough muscle. You guys were way, way, uh, you know, better for that. But I tell you, with Joe, of course, once he signed me, and you know, uh, I was dependent of the contract. I mean, I came from Yugoslavia back in the time. I, I mm -hmm. didn't have any security, you know. Like, so you are. Uh, Stabbing bodybuilders, all money that you make is from your contest. That's why I actually competed uh, so many times. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for me, that was a job you need to do. There is uh, so many shows a year. How can I say, oh, I'm going to pass on this one? This is your job. You need to do it. You're a pro bodybuilder. You have a pro card. A promoter is actually paying for your flight in the hotel. How can I say no? So I did all these shows. I mean, I did in first three years, I did like 40 in the three and a half years. 42 shows yeah and then uh you know i i continued the only the only reason I, why i didn't 95 and 96 at that time there was a switch that uh, uh they were going for dorian uh, kind of look size mm -hmm. so i decided it's better for me to pass and do my guest posing appearances in europe uh that's why i didn't go to 95 and 96 to U european grand prix tour with you and then 97 after i finally won one show you know, Canada and was second and other champions. It's okay. You know, let me just go back in a, in a, uh, in a mix. But uh, Joe, you know, we all love Joe. And I'm sure you have a million stories with him. You know, for me, the big uh, thing was 1994 at Olympia, uh, I was in best condition of my life. I was mm -hmm. shredded to the bone, dry, strided everywhere. You know, like one of those things when you can't even grab the skin. Oh, you know, yeah. when you look at yourself and you're so happy with it. Okay. But uh, I didn't really fill up for the show because I wanted to keep that uh, kind of conditioning. Because let's face mm -hmm. it, anytime you put uh, glycogen in and then you force it a little bit more, a little bit more, like you said, then you're going to lose that kind of dryness and conditioning because muscle is saturated with water. Yes, it's intercellular water. You know, so it shouldn't really show, but it does show. If you are super loaded, you're gonna lose some striations and, and, and uh, uh, dryness. But I came back. Okay, I, I went to uh, Olympia and I placed 13th, nowhere, right? And then I went to European Tour, 94, and I was beating, uh, you were there, 
also you were mm -hmm. you were excellent um you were second to doria 94 in uh, germany mm -hmm. and i think that after prejudging you know you're like two points away and i right. think that you won was right around one of those but uh, what i want to say i was beating porter Cochelle in every show in europe uh 94 like three shows england spain uh, uh, germany uh and he was top five, you know, a week before at Olympia. So when I went for the photo shoot with the, with Joe, uh, like two weeks later, and Joe was like, my loss, why didn't you look like this at the Olympia? You would be top six. And I really, you know, really, really at that time considered like, uh, you know, Joe is just talking, you know, nonsense because I'm not in a condition <laughs> like I was at Olympia. But mm -hmm. then he come here and he had the pictures from the Olympia and then he was showing me the, Polaroids. And then when I look at it, like, oh my God, the Polaroids look better than the stage shots. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the stage, I was dry to the bone, ripped to the pieces, but uh, that fullness actually made my physique more powerful, more aesthetic, uh, V taper, you know. And this is when I realized, you know, conditioning for the show, right? It's not only, you know, bone dry, it has to be that. Uh, combination of size, fullness, you know, dryness. So now when you we look back and you sit at me that 92 NOC is your favorite uh, conditioning. Yes, you were ripped. I love your physique. But would six, seven, eight, ten 10 pounds of fullness, you know, uh, make this physique even crazier? Uh, I'm sure it would. Absolutely. Because uh, when you look at, you know, if you store, let's say, 700 grams of uh, glycogen extra and plus uh, times three uh, grams of uh, water. That's like uh, 2000, that's a uh, four or five pounds difference. Okay, mm -hmm. just there, just from glycogen storage. You yeah, know, but how so, much water do you need to intake? Yeah, you need it like for because, each gram of glucose. I think you I need, remember you, you used to measure your water as well, correct? Yeah, 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 I, I, I would, you know. Uh, okay, listen. Whoever would tell you that they know this down to the science, no, it's it's all experiments. But I did 110 shows in my life, 72 pro shows. Wow. So I had a, and a, I, I kept the journals. Believe it or not, in every show, I tweaked around a little bit something just to see what uh, happens no, here. What... Let, let me stop you right there. Now, so you have these journals, you have this dialogue, you have this data. Now, does that work the same on Sunny? As it will no. work on you? No. You see, it doesn't, of course. It doesn't. And for you as well. Why? You see, That's the question. That's the cue mark. Why do you think that what works for you doesn't work for someone else? Tell me, tell me why you think that. No. that. Okay. Based of your diet. You see, your diet was based on very low carbs, right? Mine, you, yes. Yeah, yeah. And this is, you know, so you're fat adapted. You're probably in ketosis all the time, your body is using ketones very efficiently, and you are blessed that with the uh, 600 milligrams of test and 400 milligrams of DECA and uh, 100 milligrams of Anadrol, well, you can well, be hold a on. Let, let, let me stop you right there. And I found out why. You want to know why? Uh, I, I, just, I, had, I had a crazy uh, blood panel done on me uh, from Quest uh, Labs, huh? and it just came from Quest Diagnostics to Labs. They did my blood work. Uh, because I always get my blood work done now just to make sure, you know, my check everything, check my, you know, my, my calcium, my calcium deposits and my, just everything. I want to know where my D is and everything. Uh, I found out through my doctor in the blood work that my testosterone, my total testosterone that is in my body, my free testosterone, because, you know, when you get your, when you get it done, they tell you the percentage of your total testosterone total. that your body is using. My body is using 90%. Okay. So you have a lot of free testosterone. Yeah. So I don't need, so whatever I put in my body, yeah. it's utilizing 90% of what I'm putting in there. Yeah. And, and, and listen, that's abnormal. That's abnormal. Yeah. So you were, you were genetically blessed. I know that you took a part also in that, uh, Balco lab, uh, uh, we were in San Francisco 98 when they, they tested us for myostatin gene inhibitor. And uh, mm -hmm. you didn't have it, 
Ronnie didn't have it, but Flex had it. So, mm-hmm. you know, I had a chance to, to train with Flex and really seeing him transform like in a matter of three weeks, like you cannot even imagine. Kind of Kevin Lebroni transformation, but, <laughs> you know, we all knew that you can transform so fast. Mm-hmm. I was talking to, to Flex. 2002, he was like eight, ninth at Olympia and uh, didn't, you know, do very good. 2003, uh, he came to a seminar with me and Sean, and he goes like, oh, guys, I want to do the anoplastic. It's five weeks away, and I need the money. I said, okay. So I uh, just talked to Flex about it. So Sean goes, okay, you know, let's see what they look like. And when he took the clothes off, Sean started laughing. I said, look at you, skinny fat. Like, what the hell are you going to do? You have five weeks. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, 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 I need the money. Let's do it. So we st- in a matter of three weeks, Flex competed at the Ironman, if you remember this is uh, three and a half, three and a half weeks. He made that kind of condition from skinny yeah. fat to that. So he was one wow. of those freaky guys. And, you know, he doesn't train like you. He doesn't pick up 500 pound, uh, pounds on, on a uh, bench or, or 400 pounds behind an X, you know. So he was responding like this. But you see, flex was watery type. I don't see you ever being watery. You are not watery type because you are normally on very low carbs. You're dieting with the green beans and fish and stuff mm-hmm. like that, right? <laughs> so probably, you know, if I would be you, I would have tested like three weeks out, two weeks out, maybe one week out, how far you can push that loading to really, uh, you know, saturate the, the, the muscle with, the, with sugars and uh, glycogen. So on that note, when you say, is everybody the same? And I said this story many times, so people are going to say, Jesus, you said this many times. Uh, Dennis Wolf, first time I worked with him, 2007 in New York, I loaded him up like with 3,500 grams of carbs, you know, and he was flat. Imagine wow. 3,500, not calories, grams of carbs for two and a half days. So for 2007 Olympia, 5,000 grams of carbs, insane to mm. get him that full. Okay. Somebody would uh, fill up with a thousand and, uh, you are probably one of those guys. I don't know what Dave Palumbo did with you for that 96 uh, Arnold or whenever you tried it. But yeah, so to answer your question completely, we are all different. In order to know the athlete, you have to set him up on a diet and, and monitor, inspect what you expect. Mm-hmm. You know, you put him on a certain kind of uh, plan, so much carbs, so much protein, so much. Okay, if he's going in the right direction, great. Now, what do we want? to do when you step on the stage. You want to be as lean as you can, maintain as much muscle, or possibly build some more in process, which is very hard. You could, you grew into the show. You are, you are one of the few, and not too many guys that, they usually drop, lose, 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 and then come flat and catabolic, and they don't look good. You know, so that open mind, okay, you should be ready two, three weeks out, that you can yeah. now manipulate carbs and just see what happens. This is My ideally loves. how I would go. Let me ask you this, because a lot of people, um, they get to that point, right? They get to that point, and we've all been there. And you're ready, and you look great. But then the night before the show, when the people start putting the protein on, and by the time they get to that stage, something happens. Like, they look great two days out. But then by the time they get on the stage, a lot of people just, they look completely flat. They look different. But then the day after the show, when he starts eating, they look like unbelievable again. What is contributed to this? What, what, is, what, is, yeah. the, what is happening with the water and people yeah. going flat? What are they doing? Yeah. Mostly this is what happened when they reach out to diuretics and uh, they start manipulating sodium and water. And so with these normal weeks into the, the competition, and then they try to change and usually, okay, that's what they do, they do, many people do. They lower the sodium dramatically. They lower the water already like three days out, two days out. They try to carb up. Glucose need water to be stored and, and uh, sodium for glucose transport. So you need all that stuff. And you need, if you need a diuretic, you need a touch of it. I know, uh, let, let's put it this way, uh, which was 2001, Jay Cutler uh, failed the diuretic test with the five diuretics in his body. Wow. <laughs> there was a five of them. I mean, you know, so let's, let's face it. So 
uh, I used, you know, just about any diuretic you can think of. As a matter of fact, you know that we were tested for diuretics and uh, we got the list and everything. So 97 and none of the champions to play second. When Demita calls me after the show, I said, oh, I have a bad news. I said, what? You failed the diuretic test. I said, well, this is impossible. I said, yeah, yeah, you used pyretonine. Yes, I did. It's uh, Tauli's brand name, Italian uh, bodybuilder, uh, the, the, the diuretic. Look at the list. It's not there. I said, well, but this is diuretic. I said, it's not on the list. And I have that list. I found like five diuretics that were not on the list. And I, I told the... Uh, uh, Wayne, I said, listen, just to keep testing me, you're going to add one more each each time. But, uh, you know, so uh, diuretics are uh, most common thing. And I don't know how you did it. You know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, to find out from you if you did much or not. But listen, the potassium sparing diuretics that got a lot of people in trouble because, as you know, Mohammed Benaziza died. Uh, in the 92 and I don't know you were not there I think that 92 uh, you won the Germany show and uh, Benaziza was second mm -hmm. in the 92 and then you were second to Dorian in England but then you and you finished your uh, European tour you went back but I continued yeah. with uh, uh, all the guys and, and let me tell you each country we went to and Benaziza would uh, ask me like oh what can I get in uh in Italy. And so in Italy, he was looking for Dr. Zaid. Uh, they don't have Dr. Zaid, which is hydrochlorothiazide and uh, spironolactone. Then they have a Dr. Zine, which is Altizid and spironolactone is different and stronger. Mm -hmm. You know, but then in each country that we went to, he, you know, did something else, something else, something else. And unfortunately, in that uh, uh, Den Haag show, you were not there. Uh, you didn't see it. And I don't know why there's not many pictures from that show. Ben Aziza looked like absolute freak. I mean, mm. it was like freaky. But he couldn't even uh, do the uh, top six uh, posing. He, he had to like sit down and finally they, they said, okay, he wants, you know, hands down. So mm -hmm. uh, Pastel and Porter, Coachell, drag him on the stage just to get the you know, first uh, place trophy. Wow. We drove back to uh, Middle Harness in, in Holland and doctor came to see him and assumed that he would be hypokalemic. So he injected him with potassium and he was already hyperkalemic because he had a potassium sparing diuretic. Hmm. So this is the thing that uh, you know, uh, I was mentioning. Depends what you do. You have to be very careful. If you take aldactone, it's going to block your aldosterone. It's going to uh, accumulate your potassium, so the <laughs> potassium level goes up. And doctors usually think, oh, dehydrated means, you know, lost all the minerals, so they replenish you with electrolytes and high mm. potassium, which happened to Mustafa Mohammed uh, 1994, uh, 2004, 2004. Mm -hmm. And I, I basically saved his life because they were going to inject him with this and I didn't allow it and went into the, uh, you were there too. You came with the Sean, you remember to the Las Vegas hospital afterwards? Yes. Yeah, you were there too. So, uh, who was Sean, that in the hospital? What? Mustafa Mohammed. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But I remember, I remember because you guys came uh, for support. The thing was, I was celebrating a uh, top three uh, place with Gustavo on, on uh, dinner, and then I got the call from Sean. You know, room 505, Mustafa, you know, look, he's cramping up, like, oh, shit. So when I went there, I mean, he was cramped up. Same thing would have seen with uh, Benaziza. Uh, mm -hmm. In uh, 92, we were having a dinner, and Thierry Pastel came to a uh, room, and you tell everybody, oh, please, you know, you, you know, Momo is not feeling good. So we all ran. You know, Art Bedway, you know, he, he is from New York, right? Oh, yeah, he, yeah. We all went there. We saw uh, probably for just like five seconds, uh, Benaziza was sitting down like already white as a ghost and then he just locked up and fell down. And then because Porter was uh, uh, paramedics, mm. right? See, so he gave him a CPR and kicked us all out, you know, because we need the air. But anyway, so mm. this was deja vu. I'm coming to the room and uh, Sean is giving the 
Mustafa, the uh, Gatorade. And I said, no, 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 Mustafa, what did you take? So he goes, uh, Aldactum. Did you take anything else? Because at that time, if you take some loop diuretic, it can actually help and flush out the extra potassium. But he didn't, he locked up everywhere. And mm. it's song called the uh, uh, paramedics. They came and they were immediately going to put him on electrolytes and say, you can't do this. Uh, he's hyperkalemic. And he was, you are interfering with the medical procedure, urgent, you know, get out. I said, I'm not going to let you do that. Mm. So I went with them. He said, give him a uh, uh, saline. That's okay, but no potassium. Mm. And that's when doctor came, you know, in the hospital. Because, uh, you know, I understand that you were interfering. I said, you know, are you going to check his potassium? So he goes, yes. I said, good. Let's yeah. talk after and then he came and says, you saved his life because they were actually not going to do it, you know. So hopefully after that, you know, people start, uh, you know, thinking about it. Mm. Uh, so to go back on the dangers of diuretics, of course, I would urge people. And you don't need them necessarily unless, when do you need to be dry? Okay, maybe night before the show going into the, into the show, you know. So if you're mm. not really dry then, this is when maybe you can manipulate. You can manipulate right. naturally or with a little bit of diuretics. But if you rely legs, on diuretics, more than likely, you're going to flatten out and you can try to uh, supercompensate over, over spill with the carbs. You know, so. So, Milos, how, how for, the, for the listeners out there that's listening, you know, that want to reach this top conditioning, and we'll, we'll talk about the conditioning of the athletes today compared to back in the day. How do they get that without using these uh, dangerous diuretics? What, what is your, what's your advice? How, how, is everyone different or is there one protocol that people need to do? When do they need to start dropping out the sodium or should they do that? Uh, you see, uh, back in the 70s, my father, doctor at the time, right? They tell me like two most important nutrients are what? Huh? Sodium and water, salt and water. You know, mm -hmm. in a war, you need your salt and water, right? And then the uh, uh, first time that he saw me um, restricting sodium, I said, why would you do that? You know, sodium is so essential. So I don't know how you did it, but I always you know, salted my food uh, big time, you know, throughout mm -hmm. the off season. A lot of people think, okay, if you're... Uh, hypertension patient and you have a medical reason you know not to understand but you're a bodybuilder you uh you need so much fluid you need so much water you need so much salt you know that is essential so why restrict it and if you keep doing it this all the way close to the contest then you see if you just drop it a little bit uh body reacts very quickly mm -hmm. and uh, i i know a lot of bodybuilders that, that they actually don't even use their uh, their addicts whatsoever mm -hmm. so uh, water is essential, sodium is essential. Okay, and then is your caloric intake. Now, you want to compare back in the 90s conditioning and now, which a lot of guys now get pissed off, like, you know, because somebody makes comparisons. But let's face it, I mean, uh, back in the 90s, everybody was in, in great condition. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I've seen you once out of shape, really. I mean, mm -hmm. Uh, when you were off, you were still on by by uh, today's uh, um, um, standard. Standard, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to knock off because some of the guys got in crazy condition. But why do we speak for last ten years or more about nineties conditioning? Why is this even a subject of conversation? Why? <laughs> because you know people witnessed it, right? Right. Uh, what is the difference? So guys nowadays get also pissed off, like, oh, if I say they don't train hard enough, they don't diet hard enough. Mm -hmm. I really no mean thing. that. Right. I really mean that. I mean, you could go on a fish and a green bean diet for how long? Three months. Three months. Three goddamn months of fish and the green beans. Who yeah. is doing this nowadays? You know? Nobody. Uh, as, as I do the you know, guys diet, right? And then, you know, we go over. If I drop them, like, for a few days and they're, like, under 100 grams of carbs, they're like, oh, zombies in the kilometer. This is so fucking hard. I'm so flat. <laughs> I'm so flat. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. you know, I'm zombie. I can't function. I can't think. I can't. 
A, you're the goddamn promoter. And if you get yourself out of the shape, then you have to, you know, get uh-huh. yourself in shape. Uh, you mentioned that I was always in shape. Yeah, because I did the photo shoots throughout the year. I, I maintained mm-hmm. my, uh, my close to the contest condition year round. You know, but, Milos, let me ask me, you this question. Mm-hmm. Milos, how, how important is it? Now, we know you, you were always in conditioning all year round. Now, I mean, is, is it like, did you stay within like 10, 15 pounds of your stage conditioning? Did you do cardio a lot coming up to the shows? Did you do cardio all year or did you turn up cardio? How much did cardio play effect into your preparation? <laughs> we talked about dieting. Uh-oh. You know, we know you did all that stuff. We know mm-hmm. you knew the chemical aspects yeah. of it. But tell us about the cardio. I would always see you guys in the gym training. But did yeah. you do a lot of cardio? No, no, seriously. The only time I did cardio was like uh, uh, 92, 93 with uh, Sonny Schmidt because mm. he was doing it so much, you know. So like, okay, I, you know, he was my roommate and we were training partners. And then I, you know, like, of course, I feel guilty not to do it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, 93, you know, Germany, if you remember, you won that show and there was um, Sonny, Charles Clement, Andreas Munzer, myself. I mean, there was a tough contest. We were all in crazy condition. And so I have to mm-hmm. say, I, I guess I was in uh, great condition, but because I didn't let myself go uh, later, like 95, 96, 97, I didn't do much cardio, I swear to God. Because uh, why? You do cardio for what reason? To lose body fat. Right. If you don't have a body fat, you know, why would you do it? I mean, mm. you can, you know, create a catabolism of a muscle tissue, not fat tissue, because you don't have any fat tissue. So I really mm. never did it, but I train two times a day, six days a week, mm. you know, and uh, uh, as you know, probably I did a lot of those giant sets that uh, uh, giant sets don't use just uh, glucose as a fuel. You mm. have that respiratory exchange ratio, and then when it goes, <laughs> You know, you, you use both glucose and fat. So mm-hmm. I would much rather train than do, I mean, cardio, what the hell you sit on a recumbent bike. It's like, how can you occupy your mind for one hour, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and, or do the treadmill, just walk. Like for me, that was a suicide mission every time. Mm-hmm. So I would much hey, rather Milo, train. Let's, uh, hey, Ron, I want to get into asking Milos about uh, if there's one bodybuilder in today's that's competing today, that you would love to work with, who would it be and why? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let me let me see. Oh, the one of my favorites, uh, yeah, Hadi Chupan, of course. Hadi, Hadi Chupan, for me, uh, he could have won uh, 2019 and mm-hmm. he's to be second 2020. Yeah, he has uh, that combination of uh, everything. Um, Brandon Curry, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I love Brandon's uh, silhouette shape aesthetics. Uh, I would want to see his legs dramatically improve, and then that conditioning, like depth, separation, uh, and a hardness, and uh, that's all combination of pharmaceuticals, type of training, and then dieting. Uh, you see, if you Put the Brandon and then you shut the lights and you just see the silhouette, which uh, he came out for his uh, posing in uh, 2020 Olympia. You see the silhouette like, whoa, mm-hmm. it's incredible. But then when you turn the lights on, uh, yeah, I wish there is a deeper abs. I wish there is more striations, right? Deeper separation, these kind of things. And uh, people say you can't really achieve. Yes, you can. You know, but if you keep doing the same things, you can't expect different results. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, back in our times, we were all striated. You know, the, those tie-ins, separation between uh, muscles, right? And uh, I think nowadays, slowly is going away. Yeah, I was first guilty of uh, synthol injections. Yeah, so yeah, mm-hmm. I admitted publicly, I made myself look like a fool. And that's probably would stop my career, yeah. Mm. I wanted a shortcut, I did it, and uh, you know, just uh, looked ridiculous. And I know that uh, since then, a lot of people kept using it to get that fake fullness. Mm. It's fake, you know, don't do it, I, I don't like it. 
Well, you almost uh, died. You almost died, didn't you? Yeah, but this, this is due to, uh, you know, not aspirating and then it went straight into the vein and, and caused congestive heart failure. Not from the synthol, but just from that injection, it could have been anything else. Right. Which, yeah, I'm embarrassed to talk about it, but uh, it's the truth, so I would say it. But I know as I work with many athletes now, and then I ask them, do you use it? Oh yeah, you know, I say, stop using it, you know? Mm -hmm. Because some people just, uh, you know, want that size. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we also lose in the quality. But uh, uh, just to make myself clear, because we jump from one thing to another, I, I want to give the credit to the nowadays that there are a lot of guys in tremendous condition and, and shape. And uh, when we 90s bodybuilders are talking, we don't want to put them down in sense like, oh, yeah, uh, they're not as good. They're, of course, yeah, we understand. They're, they're, they're phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, but they took it uh, against Dorian when he said that Brandon wouldn't make top six in uh, 90s, right? And mm. uh, a lot of people jump on it. Dorian was speaking the truth in his opinion. And mm. I don't know what, what would yours be. But as you put me on the spot, let me ask you, who is your favorite bodybuilder nowadays? I really don't have a favorite. Um, <laughs> I really don't. No one really pops out as as a favorite to me. You know? Who was your favorite back in the early 90s when you started? Um, Lee Haney. Um, I have to say Lee Haney. I have to say Sean Ray. Sean Ray was a great poser, you know. He he had that great presence. Lee Labrada, uh, you know, risk of spar because he was shredded and things like that. Um, those guys kind of done things that we had never saw before. And, you know, Lee Labrada's presentation, how he could go on stage and just create. You had said something about the illusion. The way he would turn and, and see, Ron, it, it's like you could be big. But when you're when you have shape and symmetry and cuts, it always it always wins out the big guy. And, and Mount Milos, you know that. I mean, I mean, you know, and Milos, you were all about creating that illusion. But Lee Labrada was just a master at that presentation. And then when he would do his mandatories, and then he would get done and stand back in a lineup. See, like we would be judged, Milos. We would be judged before to even call us out. We would be judged in the back of the lineup. We're, we then were fully flexed, yeah. you know, hmm. so it, it was totally different, you know, so, you know, when I, when I see bodybuilders today, who stands out, nobody never really stands out to me hmm. because these are the things that I compare them to the presentation, the posing, you know, what are they doing when they're not out there doing a quarter turn, even the quarter turns, you know, everything symmetrical. It, it was just, it was just so Everybody practiced everything back in yeah. the day, you know, and I think Lee Labrada set that standard. You know, you talk about Sean Ray with the pose and those presentations were just phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. You, you were master of the, you see, and let's touch the other subject. You have such a natural talent. I mean, you did, uh, you sing, you were, you were, you know, acting. <laughs> Uh, you you challenged Thank you, Dwayne Chambers for a 60 meter, meter dash. I watched it. Yeah, you, you, right. you guys were, I mean, you, you seriously, who does that? I mean, you have that natural talent, explosiveness, strength, and then yeah. you can be entertainer. I mean, uh, it, it's different. So you being entertainer, I wouldn't even question I, I think maybe you never even practice your routine you just uh, mm -hmm. you, uh, you know improvise on stage <laughs> yeah i knew I, I knew the music I, I knew the music yeah. and i felt the music so i knew yeah. where the music music was going to go and uh you know we kind of took it to them places but we had to adapt uh ron and mm -hmm. malos will tell you this to some strenuous weather conditions and places sometimes the uh we, we competed one time in a meat, in a meat, uh, 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 slaughterhouse, uh, slaughterhouse. Yeah. <laughs> and remember that one time I think we were in Spain, we had stayed on a farm. We actually stayed in the barns where they had the uh, cattle oh uh, staying, and it, it, we had to sleep in that place. Wow. So it wasn't the best conditions. There was a lot of times we had no food, you know, all day, no food. Uh, we, we would get done the show. 
we, we didn't have time. We had to paint our pro tan on through the airport. I mean, me, me and Vince Taylor. Don't forget about Vince Taylor. Vince Taylor was awesome. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Vince yeah. Taylor was phenomenal. And uh, we, yeah, you just learn so much and collect so much. I have data. to ask, but Kevin, I can ask you though. You and you guys were on these tours. There were promoters. There was IPB officials. There was various people that I would think were supposed to be looking out for you. The one thing I would, if I had a bunch of bodybuilders traveling, I'd say these guys need to eat. That'd be one thing I'd want to make sure is that these guys had food or somewhere to get food. But why didn't why didn't they make sure you guys had access to food? Well, Milo's could tell you easy. Not all the time the food was was clean. You know, a lot yeah. of the food had tons and tons tons of sodium in it. A lot of times people didn't know how bodybuilders ate. And Milo's, I remember used to get into Wayne DeMillion all the time because a lot of times we land, there was no food at places. <laughs> yeah. Me, I would just have a glass of wine or something to balance out my, uh, my um, what do you call it? My, uh, yeah, my, I would balance out my sugar with a glass of wine and stuff. So that would carry me over to where these guys wouldn't do that and they needed food. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you remember, yeah, I, I fight with Wayne all the time. I mean, uh, listen, <laughs> I always speak my mind and I hate it because look, you can organize, there was like eight or 10 of us traveling, okay? How hard is to organize, you know, uh, as Ron says, you know what we eat, chicken and beef and rice and potatoes and stuff like that. Why don't you make it available? So who make it, made it available? Kerry Case, right? Kerry Case, British promoter. He always took care of us. I mean, he would have a, you know, food sent already to the airport and yeah. then, uh, you know, we had it. But in uh, the other shows, I mean, I, I remember uh, we would like to order something like uh, uh, chicken and potato. And then he came like super salty, like, oh, my God, Jesus Christ. Like, you, you can just look at it and then swell up. Yeah. It was uh, like so much salt. Wow. You know, they don't know. And uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, somebody that really respects the guys. And yeah. Come on. Uh, if you're going to be a, in six different countries and six different shows, you can pre-plan it, you know. Uh, let's put it this way. We did get per DM. I think we, we got like $50 a day when we were traveling for food, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm going to go to the goddamn Italy or uh, Spain or Germany, uh, you know, from the airport and, and buy my food for $50, you know. Uh, and, you're traveling. You don't have your cooking oh, stuff with you. Know, you you would you would land on the ground from the airport and transportation would take two or three hours to show up. Sometimes we'd be in Spain and these guys didn't bring enough vehicles. So some of us had to sit there at the airport for two or three hours. A lot of times we landed, we got on the bus and we had to go straight to the venue. We couldn't even go to the hotel to take to, to prepare. We had no food or anything, so we, it was a it was a hard knock of uh, why didn't really you, learning. After this you know? happened to you a few times, why didn't you say, "I'm not doing these European tours anymore"? They're not taking care of us. They don't they don't have the transportation. They well, because food. you always expect it to change. You know, you go back. Yeah. You know, and not and, and then sometimes the promoters would change. So unless the promoter knew what bodybuilders need, it was hard for them to really guess what how to take care of uh, of these athletes. You know lack of water, you know, not even now when you go to Europe, you know, there's not everybody, there's, there's always gas, water with gas, but, uh, you know, so it was very, very challenging uh, times back then, you know, we had to go without a lot of, a lot of things. I remember sometimes we get stuck in the airport for about six or seven hours sleeping oh. on the floor. Remember Milo? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I, this is when I got in fights with the uh, man. <laughs> Why? Okay. So let's, let's put it this way. We were going, uh, Hungary, Spain, uh, England, Czech Republic, Finland, uh, Russia, and all this stuff. But he got us Lufthansa tickets, you know, because there was like some goddamn discount. And then we, from whichever country, we had to go back to Germany and then connect. And then you miss the flight and you stay, you know, the delay. Like, man, we are all on diuretics. We are all dieting and we are all fucking dying. <laughs> and instead of, you know, you, you yeah. can take a, to our uh, flight with somebody else and be there. You know, this this is uh, my, my biggest complaint back in the day. But yeah. that, one, that's Kevin, why- uh, you told me I don't one know, time- you probably don't even remember. 97, um, yeah, uh, Russia. Oh, you know, so great. We, were, we were in Russia less than 24 hours. 
And this is uh, the time when you gave uh, Ronnie vodka and, and he beats you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, for example, uh, a Russian promoter picked us up at the airport straight into the uh, you know, uh, organized food. You had that kvass, I remember. They, they gave you the Russian alcohol, right? But they had a food yeah. for us. And we stay less than 24 hours there. But I fight with the Wayne so much. Uh, I was uh, uh, in a first call out uh, with you and Ronnie and then mm -hmm. with Nasser and Paul. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, I had to be, you know, top six. I had to be top six. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they call it top six and I'm not in top six. And then the Russian judges came to me. What's happening? Like you're not in top six. I said, well, I don't know. And Wayne was passing there. I said, hey, Wayne, uh, can I see the score sheets? No, you said tomorrow. I said, well, you know, some of those judges put me on the third place. Wow. <laughs> so can I see the score sheets? This conversation is over. <laughs> this is how it was with me and Wayne, right? Uh, I mean, I have a very good relationship with Wayne, but he was in control, right? He, he could do those kind of things. You, you get the uh, score sheets from the judges. He is the one that counts them, okay? And back in the day, you know, as you know, there was a symmetry round, muscularity round, you know, performance posing round, and then top mm -hmm. six. So you have a four rounds that you have a chance to move up and, uh, you know, but yeah, th th this was my experiences uh, with it. Yeah, but finally, uh, where did you get the idea to challenge Olympic sprinter Dwayne Chambers to a 60 meter dash? <laughs> well, you know, I think I was sitting down, I was talking to uh, Victor Conti and uh, we were somewhere and Victor was saying, you know, I was saying, you think, cause they were saying bodybuilders can't move. Bodybuilders aren't flexible. Bodybuilders this, bodybuilders that. You know, they were putting down body. He's like, I said, listen, bodybuilders can run. Bodybuilders could do everything that all those other athletes do. He says, yeah, you, you, I got somebody. You think you can run? I says, yeah, I know I can run. <laughs> and uh, he said, Dwayne Chambers. I said, I didn't know who Dwayne Chambers was and I didn't care who Dwayne Chambers was. All I know is I'm a competitor and I'm a bodybuilder and I can run. But anyway, I, I, I put, I talk too much, put my foot in my mouth because when I got to California, <laughs> the guy kicked my ass so bad. It was embarrassing. And then yeah. come to find out, he was he actually beat Maurice Green in the <laughs> Olympic Games. He was one of the fastest runners in the world. I had no idea. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I knew everything about it because, of course, I gave uh, it my best shot. You should have told me, Milos, Kevin, are you crazy? You I mean, listen, this guy. yeah, yeah, such a genetic wonder. You're like, <laughs> God damn. Yeah, well, I'll do it. <laughs> let me put it this way. Oh my I god. Actually, I videotaped it, but I videotaped it from the front. So when you guys took off, you know, yeah. if you look from the side, you could probably see that he is uh, ahead of you. But like, oh. <laughs> but you listen, know, the but frequency of us steps. Respect, but, but Milos, I said, listen, if I race him, we're going to race in the grass. So they didn't want to race in the grass. And then I said, okay, we'll run on track. Then I said, okay, if we race, we're going to race 40 yards because I know I'm fast in 40 yards. He says, no. We're going to race on a track. We're going to put spikes on. I never had spikes on. I've never been in uh, those yeah. uh, those those things. What are those things blocks. you stand in? Blocks. I've never yeah, been is. in blocks. So yeah. I never wore spikes. I've never been in blocks. And I never ran like that on a track. So my whole body was, was not even oh. positioned right when I was coming out of the blocks. And when I came out, I took off. And I broke my, uh, my, my, oh. my, my, my main toe on my right foot. You'll see where I stumble. Wow. And then I came up a little bit. But the guy was gone after that. <laughs> I, <laughs> that I, I think that uh, first, uh, first uh, few steps, you were step, step for step with him. Oh, I mean, he was, really. that, yeah, but he just took off. And I was like, oh, my God. You know? <laughs> like the road it was, runner. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it, was like, it was like I was moving in slow motion. And one spot, he was gone. It well, just goes to show you, you know, people can look at something and think they can do it, but until yeah. you actually get beside the pros and those top guys in the world, you have no idea what it takes to get to that level. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. You know, Phenomenal. It was incredible. Dwayne Chambers is an awesome guy, matter of fact.
yeah yeah i actually i have a bunch of pictures i was going to send you today also because i have a you me and uh uh Dwayne, you know you get you were spotting him on the incline presses and uh yeah Who's that? you know there was uh gunter flex I don't oh know. Yeah. yeah yeah there was there was a bunch of people there yeah and by yeah, the way the, Carlos, I, I, yeah. I just want to say man i want to say thanks thanks you know we got to wrap it up soon but i want to yeah. say thanks for uh for everything you've done like you know you you took all your knowledge you took all your education you know, good, bad, everything that you saw on the tours and you reach back and you help everyone uh, today in today's, uh, uh, you know, a time in bodybuilding and fitness and everything. Not only are you training uh, men, you're also training women and you've made a, a, a huge, like, you know, what do you do with your life? But you've taken and you pearl out into helping people and, and motivating people, man. And it's very inspiring to see you giving back on the level that you do. And uh, it's an honor to have you on the empty Lebron report. You're a very, very good friend of mine. And um, you're just an incredible person. And I want to say thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, know. you so much. I, I can chat with you for the next two hours, but the, I know you guys I have limitations. Yeah. I, I, I want to give, I want to give Milos credit for something that I don't think a lot of people, people that have been around and read the magazines that know this, but, you know, everybody talks about Kuwait, Oxygen Gym, how these people come from all over the world to go there and improve. But 10, 15, 15 years before that, Milos was the guy that set the standard. He had this Coliseum Gym in Fullerton, California, and there was a hotel like across the street. I think it was yep. a residence in. And yes. guys, geez, I, I think it was like Dennis Wolf, Hide Yamagishi, Luke Wood, Gustavo, Dennis James. Dennis James, I think even Flex Lewis when he was very young. Yes. A lot yes. of these guys would come from all over the world. They would stay there and they would have Milos train them for a couple weeks or, or longer. And they all made drastic improvements. And I think mm -hmm. that was the model for what would later be the Kuwait Oxygen Gym experience where these people, but it all started with Milos. Yeah, Thank a lot you. of things started with Milos. It really yeah. did, Milos. You, uh, were, you were the originator you, of so much, man. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin. Just one final thing, because you mentioned Victor Conti, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you, are you aware that I was working with Victor on the Project Wall record? You were? Yeah, you don't know that. Okay. Let me no, know. I had no idea. Very quickly, because now when you mentioned Vane and every, everybody, so I was uh, talking to Victor about many things. You know, back in the day, like '98, '99 tell him how to do this and he applied mm -hmm. this to many other athletes and then he called me once the communists they're all kicking ass you know we can break the world record i said of course you know records are to be broken so he said, are you up for it i said like yeah so if you google it project world record there is some uh, um, information that you can see so i told him let's break the hardest record to be broken what is it fastest man alive so you mentioned mm. maurice green right Maurice Green yes. was a war record holder at the time, 978, I remember. So I said, like, okay, let's take the guy that has no chance because he wasn't really there. So, okay, you don't know if what we did made a difference. So Tim Montgomery was not uh, in his prime and didn't make any results. To make long story short, in nine months, we broke the world record. Wow. There was uh, Charlie Francis. Uh, we, we met together in uh, San Francisco. Charlie Francis mm. was a, a coach of Ben Johnson. Uh, he is a wizard as far as uh, sprinting and uh, uh, biomechanics and everything else. Trevor Graham, uh, which is Marion Jones and uh, Tim Montgomery's coach, uh, Victor Conti and myself. You know, this is uh, how we created that project for record. And uh, uh, we broke the record in nine months. <laughs> so I didn't know if you knew that. So I just no, have to brag I did about not it. know it. I did not know it. But you know what, Milos, you have all kind of bragging rights, brother, because you've earned them. You've a man of your word. You always speak the truth. And uh, the world respects you, man. And I want to say that I'm honored to call you a friend and to see all the great things you're doing now, man. And Ron, yeah. um, I think I think we're about to wrap up a great episode. Number eight, MD LaRona report, Milo Sarchev. Milos is certainly taking it to another level, baby. I want to show this to there, you, Ron? Kevin. This is a training journal of mine from, uh, geez, 2000, the year 2000, so 21 years ago. Whose picture did I have inside? It wasn't yours, Kevin. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That was my inspiration. Wow. Yeah, I wonder it looked like that dude right there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I've seen that, Ron. Yeah. I appreciate it. Hey, Milos, I would love to have you back on um, the show again. And I do, I, I mean, there's so much to talk about, but I want to talk about the next time we have you back. I want to talk about your training. I really want to tap into how you would train your sets. Would you do supersets and all these things? Because you had such a nice flair uh, to your quads. Is there something different, something unique that you did to bring those flair out to your quads? But we'll save that for the next time you come on. All right. I'll be ready anytime. All right, man. For now, you know, guys, I love you, Kevin Yeah, now, now Kevin Lavroni with uh, Ron Harris. And um, we're signing off with uh, the man himself. <laughs> the man himself. When I say himself, the mastermind, Milos Sarchev. Milos, thank you very much. And welcome, guys. Thanks once again for uh, joining us all here. And uh, that eighth episode of the Lavroni Report. Kevin Lavroni, Milos Sarchev. And Ron Harris, we're out, baby. Peace. All right.